One of the most pervasive ideas in the world today uh, is the idea that powerful interests pull the strings in democracy. Uh, whether it's uh, big banks or corporations, uh, the swamp or the deep state, whether it's coastal elites or the religious right. You know, the sense is out there that the playing field is tilted against ordinary people and, and they don't have a chance. This idea out there has led to widespread cynicism. It's led to alienation. It has led to the populist movements around the world, uh, including the election of President Trump. And with all great myths out there, there's some truth to the argument. Certainly in this country, we have rising economic inequality. We have racial and gender injustice. We have uh, powerful uh, corporate uh, influence in our elections. All of these things are, are true. And yet there's something I think that is often missed, which is that even today, even with all of those things, that individuals really do have enormous ability uh, to shape events and to shape uh, policies, particularly on the state and local levels. That's something that I've seen as a state representative uh, during 10 years of, of service in the, in the Connecticut General Assembly. I've seen it over and over again. And one of the reasons why I ran for the legislature in the first place, uh, you know, I had worked on national politics. I'd worked for uh, a presidential candidate. But one of the reasons why, instead of doing that, I wanted to work on the state and local level is because it's there that you really give people the opportunity, I think, more than anywhere else to realize the power that they already have. So I want to talk about one of those uh, examples uh, here this afternoon uh, and tell a story, and, and hopefully um, that's helpful. So six years ago, uh, this spring, uh, it was the spring of 2012, uh, I was uh, going in for a routine uh, medical appointment with my uh, doctor, and I went in, and he asked me to go get a test, and I did. And I went back to him, and uh, he had me sit down in his office, and he told me, uh, Matt, I, I hate to tell you this, but a test came back, and you're not going to believe this, but uh, you have cancer. And uh, there was a lot going through my head that moment, uh, a lot of questions. And he told me, just so you know, this is really urgent. We're going to have to have uh, perform surgery on you within the next 24 hours or so. So I had a lot of questions. I had a lot of things I needed to do. I needed to call uh, my friends, my family, my loved ones. Uh, I needed to get a second opinion, make sure that he knew what he was talking about. And, and as I was heading out of the doctor's office and processing the emotions, one of the things he said almost in passing was just a warning. He said, by the way, just so you know, one of the frequent side effects of treatment for cancer, whether it's surgery or chemotherapy or radiation, one of the most frequent side effects is permanent infertility. Um, and by the way, if you, you have a chance, there are things you can do to protect your fertility in advance of your treatment. So, well, I had a lot of things to think about uh, right then and there. A lot of phone calls I needed to make. I had 24 hours. Uh, and one of the things I found was that it is possible to preserve your fertility uh, if you have cancer. Um, and for men, it's not a big deal. It costs a few hundred dollars. Uh, for women, the cost is astronomical. You have to, it costs $15,000 or more uh, out of pocket. Fortunately, uh, that wasn't uh, a big financial burden for me. But in the state of Connecticut, not a single insurance company uh, was covering that procedure. So what does that mean? It means that for young women, they have to make a choice between whether or not they want to ever be able to have a biological family or run that risk, or whether they need to get the life-saving care that they need to, to fight the cancer that they've just been diagnosed with. And that is a choice that I found uh, terrifying. So fortunately, I went, I went through surgery, I went through treatment, and I can say uh, with happiness that I uh, was uh, declared cancer-free. Uh, and the next year, I went back to the legislature, and I said, you know, this is an injustice. I remembered this issue, and I said, I'm going to put in a bill, and I'm going to fix this issue. So in 2013, um, I introduced uh, my, the first bill to require that insurance companies in Connecticut 
uh, cover fertility preservation for young people uh, fighting cancer. Well, what happens? Well, I'm a powerful legislator, and that's great. But what happened was the insurance industry came in, and they lobbied against the bill, and they killed it. They said, we don't want to pay for this stuff. OK. So the next summer, I, I called up the University of Connecticut. We had them do a study and try to figure out what the cost of this would be and make a real good case for why we should do this. And so 2014, this is the bill from 2014. I reintroduced the bill. And this year, I got it out of committee. We did a, a, a study. We, we made the case, and again, the industry fought us. In the end, again, the industry beat it, and the bill died. So this time, I th did some thinking, and I went, and I figured, you know what? There, there are people who actually make money off of protecting fertility. They, they, they're folks who make drugs, the pharmaceutical companies. So I had a pharmaceutical company come and do an analysis, and they made a case. And so we can, went back the next year, and in 2015, brought up another bill, and you know what happened? We lost. Uh, the, the insurance industry uh, killed it uh, and, and weren't able to pass the bill. Tried it again, 2016. Tried it again. What happened? You know what happened. We lost. So 2017, I'm doing this now. I'm just sort of throwing in the bill because I've, I've basically given up hope on this, but I, but I try uh, one last time uh, to try to pass this uh, bill to ensure that young people uh, who have cancer can at least access this benefit. And something different happened in 2017. Something slightly different happened. And what happened was we held a public hearing, and one woman came up and testified. Uh, her name is Melissa. She doesn't live in my district. She lives on the other end of the state in Stanford. She's 34 years old. She's a single mother. And a week after she gave birth to her daughter, Poppy, she was diagnosed with stage 3 breast cancer. And she had the same conversation with her doctor that I had with mine. She wound up putting $15,000 on her credit card, uh, which I think she may still be trying to pay off. And she wanted to do something about it. So she came up to Hartford. She heard about my bill. Somehow she, she heard about it. And she decided to come up and testify. And uh, so she did. She made a case. Uh, oh, this is her. Uh, and she told her story. Uh, and she told her story. Uh, and she also did some research. And she did some math. And you know what? She did a better job of crunching the numbers than that pharmaceutical company or the University of Connecticut did. And she told her story much better than I told my story. And she went and she talked to each and every member of the insurance committee. And she didn't just talk to you know, those of us who are Democrats and believe in big government and lots of uh, strong laws. She also talked to Tea Party Republicans. And she made an economic case to those guys. And when one of the members of the committee blocked her on Twitter, she went up to him and she cornered him and said, why did you block me on Twitter? Let's talk about this, talk this through. And he unblocked her. And, and, and what happened, I, I've never seen anything like this. I've gone through hundreds of hearings. I've, I've listened to thousands of bills come up. But when this one young woman came up and made a case and talked to people and did her homework and didn't leave, legislators listened. And at the end of her testimony, and this is not the way things normally work, she got a, she got a round of applause from the members of the committee. So what she wound up doing is she wound up going around and meeting with each and every legislator. She recorded a personalized video for every one of the 36 members of the state senate. She never went away. She would sit down in the middle of the cafeteria in the legislature and not leave so that every time a legislator went and grabbed lunch, she would be there. And in the end, we were able to pass the bill through the, oh, this is the roll call in the Senate, and roll call in the House. But we were able to pass the bill 148 to nothing in the House of Representatives. And 30. <laughs> and 36 to nothing in the State Senate. And this was 2017. And you look back, remember last year. What were people talking about in Washington? There were fights all year long over health care. And at a time when Democrats and Republicans agreed on precious little, 
They certainly didn't agree on the issue of health care. But in Connecticut, we were able to go a different direction and expand coverage. And we didn't do it because of strong legislative pushes. We didn't put, do it because of special interests. We did it because one young woman realized her own power, decided to be a pain in the neck, decided to not go away, and decided to not take no for an answer. And I think that really gives me hope um, for democracy. So in this, yeah, so that, this was the House, uh, and we, then we went up to the, the Senate. And the Senate, uh, the Senate went around the room, and there, there are 36 of them, and they all uh, gave speeches. And, and one of the things that was really gratifying about it, uh, you can see her lobbying individual state senators. Um, and then when, when the bill came up for a vote, um, the lieutenant governor, who oversees the uh, Senate, uh, invited Melissa up onto the dais where the control of the legislature is, uh, where she bangs the gavel, and gave, gave Melissa control of the state Senate. And you can see her sort of overseeing, overseeing things. And it passed 36 to nothing. So Melissa is smart, and she's tenacious, and she has a good story, and she's um, good at what she does. But there's nothing unique about Melissa. I think a lot of us have stories. A lot of us has issues. But the thing that Melissa did that so many other people should do is realize that you've got people who work for you, whether they're city councilmen, whether they're state legislators, whether they're governors or a member of Congress. You've got people who work for you, and you should learn how to use them. And if there are problems that you see in this world that are not being addressed, that aren't being fixed, maybe they can be. Oftentimes they can be. Too often, I think people don't realize they can be if they just take the time to ask. And if somebody does block you on Twitter, go and ask them to unblock you uh, so that you can at least make sure that that dialogue happens. So with that, I, this last slide, I think, is so important because it wasn't just Melissa. It's young people with cancer all over the state of Connecticut who've had a difference, who've seen a difference. And since our law was passed last spring, other states have moved to copy us. Rhode Island has done so. Kentucky is debating that legislation right now. Um, and it's being copied now uh, in legislation all across the country. And it's thanks to, thanks to Melissa's efforts that that happened. So we need more Melissa's. Thank you.